to everyone for being here. Um, and we just wanted to start off today by beginning on a note of appreciation for all of the work that has been done so far. So if you're involved at a work group at Coastline in any way, can you please just raise your hand? Thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you so much for the work that you have done. Um, Anne is teasing me that we're on a work group, not or a design team, not a work group. So for those of you who don't know, we do have a YouTube video explaining this as well. Uh, this summer, our work groups are going to be transforming into design teams, which is very exciting. And then we will be transforming in the long run to our advisory and implementation teams. So there's a detailed video with me and Elizabeth right there on the YouTube channel discussing that shift. Today, uh, we have some fabulous panelists, so I'd like to ask each of them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about uh, their background and how they are uh, involved in Coastline Pathways. Good afternoon, I'm Dana Emerson. I'm Dean of Instruction at the Westminster Legion Campus. I am working with uh, Coastline Pathways on the program mapping group. And um, I do have a little bit more experience in guided pathways and one of the first iterations that happened in the Pacific Northwest years ago when guided pathways was um, focused on CTE um, for students that were coming out of high school, moving through community colleges, and either going on a path towards the university or going straight into a career. I'm Joshua Lamentis. I am a communication studies faculty member and department chair. And then I am the Guided Pathways, uh, or Coastline Pathways faculty coordinator. Uh, my experience in Pathways comes from uh, my experience as a program coordinator in learning communities at Cal State Long Beach before I was here. Uh, and so my, my efforts are really in how we scale some of the, the best practices from learning communities into Guided Pathways. Cody Pontius, I'm the Distance Learning Department. I'm part of the Persistence Work Group, uh, and then I'm also part of the core team. Um, just really thrilled to be part of the change here. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Priya Chaploth and I am the Vice President of Strategy at National Center for Inquiry and Improvement with Rob. Uh, my background is actually, uh, I owe my entire life to community colleges. Uh, I used to go to, I used to live across the street and then ended up taking classes and working at Mount San Antonio College as a researcher many years ago. Um, and I've since then worked with the RP group on a variety of projects, including the Student Support Redefine study um, that I think Coastline is familiar with. And uh, now I do a lot of work around guided pathways, but also around financial stability. So as we as a college develop um, guided pathways for students, how can we ensure that their basic needs are met, food, transportation, healthcare, housing, all the real life issues that can derail even the best guided pathways. How can we make sure that students stay on path and complete their educational goals? And hello, my name is Rob Johnston. I'm the founder and president of the National Center for Inquiry and Improvement. And I've had the good fortune uh, to be on the national kind of guided pathways scene since the first guided pathways project that was across the country, which was completion by design back in 2011. Um, there were career pathways projects before then, and kind of CTE in various states, California, with career ladders project. But that kind of approach of connecting the transfer and classic CTE programs on, on guided pathways really started in 2011, and I've been working on it ever since. Um, working on state projects, running the California guided pathways project here in California, the demonstration project with the 20 colleges as well as projects in about 15 other states. Um, and working with a group of 21 colleges, including Coastline, directly over a two-year period to help the colleges implement guided pathways at scale. So I'm excited to be here. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we have some prepared questions today, and then we will have time for questions and feedback from the audience as well. One of the big questions that I wanted to start with is, what are the key misconceptions that people have around Guided Pathways movement overall. You guys aren't doing that again. Um, so I would say, when you, when, 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 as the Guided Pathways movement evolved from you know 2011 to now, we have addressed a large number of kind of perceptions, misperceptions, myths about pathways. I would say the two biggest ones. Um, one is that Guided Pathways restricts choice that it actually is eliminating or restricting student choices. Um, when in fact what it's actually designed to do is help students make informed choices. 
Uh, we like to say what we're doing is architecting the student choice process um, rather than choosing from all 300 items on the Cheesecake Factory menu at once. That maybe what we do is choose uh, initially something that we might call areas of interest where rather than choosing between all your programs, maybe we say you're more interested in business versus natural science. And then we can help you make that decision further down the path about what you might want to take. I think the other big misconception about guided path is there are a number of them is that guided pathways equals maps. This idea that if we just have maps, we've got guided pathways. In fact, although maps are important, there are maybe five or 10 percent of the overall things that need to change under a guided pathways mindset. As we think of students, we do definitely need to clarify their paths once we're trying to figure out where they're trying to go, what's the optimal way for them to get there. The maps help with that. But even the maps don't do anything by themselves. They have to be translated into a customized education plan for every student because students come in with different credits, they come in with different needs, different transfer destinations, and although the maps are a very important initial step, um, I think a little too much emphasis was placed on the mapping early on and not on the other parts of Pathways as well as that, that customized education plan for every student uh, is really the, the most important thing um, under the Pathways umbrella. Yeah, um, to add to some of the local, uh, I think, misconceptions, uh, is uh, one of the things is that uh, Guided Pathways is just another initiative um, being passed down to us from the state, uh, and that it's something uh, that's over here off to the side. Uh, and what we need to be looking at is that Guided Pathways is our new way of doing, doing work, right? Uh, the, the, the issue is that Guided Pathways uh, it's not just another initiative, it's something that's not a pilot program. It's something that we're going to launch at scale that shifts our, our college. And it's going to be messy, and it's going to be ambiguous at first. And we're going to start with 1.0 in 2020, and then we're going to move to 2.0 and 3.0. And we're going to keep improving upon this, this, this framework that we're applying to our, to our college. And it's not about doing more work, right? Sometimes it's going to be, as we mentioned earlier, doing less work. Uh, but it's just about doing the work differently. Uh, and the, the emphasis on doing it differently is on the benefit for the student. Not the benefit for the faculty, not the benefit for the staff, but the benefit for the student, right? Sometimes that will be harder for us, sometimes it'll be easier for us. And so really I think the misconception is that this is something that's just gonna cause more work because it's another initiative like student learning outcomes that we have to check a box and work on. That was a dig at student learning outcomes from your student learning outcomes coordinator. We love that song. Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, well, I am. Um, I think um, a misconception is that guided pathways is something that you kind of just maybe you put into a binder and you give to students, and then students go do guided pathways. And that's not what it is at all. It really is a cultural shift in the way that the institution operates in terms of helping students reach their goals, their academic and goals for academic success. And if we start to shift the way that we see it in those regards, then we can start to see how we operate differently under a Guided Pathways framework. It's really that philosophical kind of idea, the reason why we do the things that we do to help students succeed. And so a misconception is, again, it's something that we give to students and then they go and do it, and that's not it at all. It really is this internal process that we go through in terms of a cultural shift to help students be successful. Uh, I also wanted to add that um, it's a cultural shift within our college, and it's not just the design team that are doing the work. It's not just classified that are doing the work. It's not just faculty that are doing the work. It's really a whole college effort. Um, and so if you're not kind of already involved, definitely get involved um, and make the change happen the way you want to see it happen, the way that we want students to succeed. That was great. Thank you. Um, so we touched on this a little bit with Josh's comment, but I want to talk about sort of the structural incentives from the chancellor's office where they came down and sort of said, hey, you have to spend this money and work on this project. Uh, beyond that specific grant you know, mandated activity. Why are we doing this work? And specifically, I'm hoping Rob and Priya can talk about that at the national level. Yeah, so I mean, um, I was actually looking, I was trying to look up some of your data, so I was questioning uh, the sentence there. 
right past them. Um, look, so there's this perception out there at a lot of California community colleges, like Guided Pathways started in 2017 when the Chancellor's Office put money behind Guided Pathways, which in fact, of course, is not true. Um, as I mentioned, the national movement started back in 2011, um, and other states have been, I mean, there have been state level projects years ahead of California's, um, in pl especially places like Ohio and Michigan and Arkansas, Florida, and North Carolina, uh, increasingly in states like Oregon, Washington, Hawaii. Um, so this is absolutely a national movement, but where it comes from is a basic understanding that it's not okay that as many students aren't completing in our colleges as there are today. Like you have to start from the standpoint of, of I mean, we look, we, we had a little bit of the morning session talking about the data itself. We always can, I mean, we are both IR people in our backgrounds. We can play any kind of data manipulation games you guys want to play. Um, but when you look at it, if you look at students entering higher education who have the goal of a certificate or degree or transfer, and I'm not talking about the goal on the application, I'm talking about an overall goal nationally. Um, if you look at that percentage of students who come to a community college who have actually the goal of a bachelor's degree, at some point in their education, that number is above 80%. So the rhetoric we share around, not all, not all students are trying to complete, right? Yeah, that's true. You do have them. In California, we have skills bidders. And at Coastline, you have maybe more of these students on average, slightly more of these students in the average community college. Aaron mentioned last hour that maybe 25% of your students are kind of on alternate tracks to things that aren't certificate degree or transfer. At an average community college in this country, maybe it's 10 to 15%. So you're a little higher there. But it, for the most part, your students are trying to complete something. Um, and one of the things I always share at the point when we talk about, well, not all students are trying to complete, is whose kids are you talking about there? Are you talking about your kids or someone else's kids? Because in my experience, you're often talking about someone else's kids when we make the statement, well, not all students are trying to complete. And I will share with you that most often in my experience, you're talking about kids who don't look like your kids. Right, so there's some institutional racism going on with this. We start talking about, well, not everyone's on the path to completion. Um, I get really nervous from an equity standpoint when we start going down that path. So I think what you have, if you're doing this work because there's a chancellor's office initiative, or you're doing this work because your president wants you to do it, or because someone read Davis's book, uh, you're not gonna go very far with this, because when it gets hard, you're gonna give up. Um, and you're gonna give in to doing things the same way you've always done them. The, the pressure from the system, I mean your system, and the system of higher education, is to just keep doing things the same way you've always been doing. Right, you, your entire infrastructure, your committee structure, all of your structures, are built to keep the same thing going. They're actually not built to innovate. It requires doing things very differently. And I think you guys at Coastline have done some really good work on this. And so I think that the key to this is you have to, what brings you to the table here has to be a mission of social justice or equity or economic mobility or any of the things that drive you to come do this work for your students. You can't be doing this because it's an initiative or because the chancellor's office gave you pennies on the dollar to spend some focus on this. It's really just chump change in the relative scheme of things from a money side. So if that's the reason you're doing it, it's not gonna go very well. So. I also think that the national conversation over the last 10, 15 years, maybe even more, has shifted from a focus on access to a focus on success. So we used to care so much more about butts in the seats, right? Getting our enrollment numbers up and there would always be new students at the door, so you just crossed your fingers and hoped that students went along and did whatever they needed to. And I think as the focus has shifted on success, we've had to ask really tough questions about what does it mean for a student to make substantive progress? And really tough questions like, are we helping students or are we hurting students by the structures and processes and policies that we have in place? The other big shift from access to success has also been what we called non-traditional students before, students with jobs, students with children, students with um, military background or students that were foster youth students. Those used to be non-traditional students and in some cases they are the overwhelming majority of your actual student population. So our structures are still designed for those like glossy, you know, freshmen right out of high school that are still staying with their parents and on the health insurance of their parents who don't have to work. And the reality is we have more and more students who are student parents who are veterans, who are um, juggling so many different aspects of real life while needing to come to school. And are our 
uh, kind of traditional systems equipped to support and really empower our current student populations to succeed. That's for me what I've been. To, to add to, to what Priya uh, eloquently put is that, that shift to, to success, right? And for a very long time, one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons we need to do this is that we've been the ones defining what success means for a student for, for so many years. And that needs to change. Um, there's more and more research out there. The Education Advisory Board put out uh, a report that we should no longer define student success. That students are the ones should be defining their success. That if going to a counselor and coming out with a plan, that's success, right? And so we shouldn't be looking at success from just completion. Uh, and pathways is one of the ways to enhance the amount of successes that we can create for students, right? And I think that's one of the uh, the major reasons we need to be doing this is where we should be doing it to enhance the opportunity for the students to define their own successes and then give them those opportunities and help them to succeed. Just one thing on that because I want something to not go unaddressed. That doesn't mean we can sit back and say, well, every student is successful because it's their definition. Right. Now, let's be clear, that's not what Josh was saying, right? Because that's what we've done historically. Say, well, you can't measure student success. A student success is when a student comes to my classroom and has an epiphany. All right, well, that's cool. Like, what does that epiphany do for them in their life outside of your class? Like, so there's a, there's a, we're walking between these things, and it's the translation between right. these mini successes and what it means for the student once they leave here that we have to be critical. The completion is a very good predictor of that success. It's not the only predictor. I think that's where EAB is trying to go is we need to connect the dots between completion and what comes after. And for many of our students, they're transferring with, with junior standing and moving on. But others, even after that, they're entering, all of them are entering the workforce, hopefully, right? So what does it look like to translate the things they do with us later into their career? And it could also be that we're including their definition of success yeah. into the metrics of success that we're already operating from. And so then that it's not just your GPA, your time to completion, and have you transfer to a university. It's also, did you were you able to afford your books this semester? Were you able to get the classes that you needed this yeah. semester? Do you even know what your major or area of interest is this semester because maybe it changed from last semester? And have we set up a program or a pathway or structures to help you um, find your way towards that finish line, whatever that finish line may be. Maybe yesterday you thought you wanted a certificate and now you took a class and that first day you had with this amazing instructor and now you're thinking no I, I think I might want a degree in this so maybe that's also what it is it, you're right it's not just whatever the student wants success to be it's not ignoring what student success is from a student perspective and keeping it ingrained into everything else that we're doing so that we can help students be successful yeah, I really appreciate that, and I appreciate that conversation. I know this came up a little bit in the earlier panel, so I wanted to make sure that we discussed it here, too, is a lot of times people will say, oh, well, Coastline, we just have a ton of people here for one class, or, well, we just have these part-time students, they can't take as many classes. So I was wondering, if, Rob, if you could talk a little bit about part-time students and what we know about the relationship with them, and especially as it relates to Coastline. Just trigger my rant. Thank you for that, Jeff. <laughs> um, all right, so here, here's the short version of my part-time student rant. And my part-time student rant is based on years of listening to people in rooms like this tell me, well, Rob, we can't do pathways, or we can't do X, or we can't do Y, because so many of our students are part-time. Like, okay, well, let's explore that for a second. Like, let's, let's explore that. Uh, the place I'd like to explore it most is why so many students are part-time. Let's start with that. Because we make a pretty fundamental assumption that the fact that a student is part-time is not within our control at all. It's their life circumstances, it's that they have to work, that their parents, that their X, that their Y, that their Z. Which, by the way, conveniently absolves us of all responsibility to actually make things better for part-time students and maybe encourage more of them to go more full-time or to be more invested in the college. Just a couple of quick reasons your students are part-time. Yeah, they're working. Right, so there's one angle to help them be less part-time is to have them work on campus, right? To it, try to work on student financial stability packages that are wrestling with the issues that are making them work. Um, so that's one aspect of the part-time student uh, issue. Another reason they're part-time is because they don't know why they're here in the first place. 
right? Why would I commit full time to something which I don't understand what I'm, why I'm here, right? I travel around the country a lot. I have, I live in a lot of airport bars and hotel bars and brew pubs. I've earned, I've earned the, I was at Yard House last night. This is where I, I cannot tell you how often I have conversations with servers, and, and this just happened last night. Um, and the servers say, oh, I go to Orange Coast. Like the, the, the relationship between the service industry and the community college is strong. So you ask those students, well, what do you, so I happened to be Orange Coast last night. What are you doing at Orange Coast? And there's three answers to this question. One is the student who knows exactly what they're doing, exactly where they're going, exactly where they are, and exactly what's next. That's about one in 10 students. <laughs> the next biggest group is the student who says, I'm gonna transfer. You know, like in what, to where? I don't know, just know I want to transfer. Like I want a bachelor's degree. So this is a student who still doesn't know why they're here. The third group's my favorite, which is also the biggest. Is, well, I'm just taking some classes. <laughs> okay, to do what, in what? Yeah, I don't know, just taking some classes. <laughs> right, so here's a student who has no idea why they're at that college, why they're at our course. And so why would that student go more full time? They don't know why they're there in the first place, right? So this issue of motivation and, and, and drives it. Uh, the final issue on the part-time student status is you're assuming they want to be part, like that they can't go full time, it being under their control misses one key issue, which is part of the reason is your schedule. The way we schedule courses is not student focused, right? It's focused at us, right? And it's actually not focused at the student program. It's focused on individual courses. And so, I don't know what job you had at 19, but when I was 19, if I went to tell my boss, hey, guess what? I know last semester I could work Tuesday, Thursday from 1 to 6. Now all my classes are Tuesday, Thursday, 1 to 6. Sorry, I can't work then. Can you shift my hours? My boss would have said, no, I'm not shifting your hours. You're going to have to not do those classes. Now I'm a part-time student. right? And if you don't think that happens, that happens. So my part-time student ran in is about making sure students have a clear vision of why they're here, they have the right financial stability. By the way, they know the effect of being part-time. So I got a student who's part-time, here comes to me and says, hey, I can only take two classes. I'm starting with the Ocosa. I'm like, oh cool, well then you're on schedule to graduate in spring of 2028. You okay with that? Because that's what it means to only take two classes. Right, well she doesn't want to stay here until, oh, she loves you guys, but she doesn't want to stay here until 2028. <laughs> right, so putting the end in mind in front of students to help them see, hey, by the way, just taking one more class a semester and two in the summer, it's 2024. Now if that's too late, well, let's figure out other ways you can take nine or 12 units. And so it's those type of things that I think matter a lot. The that's only... the short version of it, by the way, by far the short. Uh, the only thing I want to add about that is also that uh, when we look at something like Guided Pathways, which is an, uh, an approach to creating a more structured experience for students, structured meaning um, that they have a sense of predictability. If I do X, Y, Z, I know the college is going to do A, B, C. I'm going to have the classes I need when I need them. Um, I, the, uh, I'm going to be able to, whatever plan that I have built, for my comprehensive goal, um, achievement is actually going to be realistic. And the the interesting part is guided pathways. Even though it's more, it's easier to design for full time students. It actually has greater benefits for non full time students. Full time students who are maybe not working at all have a lot more flexibility than part time students, and they need a, a predictable schedule relatively less. Part time students that are juggling work life balance, uh, family issues would love to have some anchor to know, okay, if I come to school on these days at these times, or if I know that my classes are gonna be available when I need them, it might make it more likely to their ability to take more classes or to at least know that there is an end in sight instead of having a lovely book of a transcript. Uh, over the years. I think as you also kind of set the pathways movement into motion and you start building these support structures like clear, uh, career exploration, you start getting more buy-in from the student as well and they start to become more passionate and want to take more classes so they'll find ways to do it. That's great, thank you. And I just wanted to highlight too, um, you heard a lot of examples in those answers of little things that you can do if you're on the elevator with a student you can say, hey, what are you studying? Oh, well, we have a career center if you're not sure, right? Have you met with a counselor? So there's this handout, we've sent it out before, it's also on the blue table. It's 10 ways everyone can support student success. No matter what your role is at the college, you can be doing something to help encourage this direction and this movement from the beginning. So that's the good news, you all have homework. Um, okay, I wanna shift to a question. <laughs> Me too. Uh, a question um, about AB 705. 
and what it is, how it's affecting coastline, and then also how does it fit into the broader guided pathways framework. Data goes this one. Yeah, just straight up looking at data. So AB 705, Assembly Bill 705, in case you don't know, is effectively a law that was put into place that generally eliminates the um, assessment test for placement for students into math or English. And what the state basically said was, here's this law, and um, here are all these colleges, now you figure out how you're going to now be compliant with the law. We're not gonna tell you exactly what to do, but we are going to give you some guidelines, like students, um, no, there's no assessment test, right? Um, and what it also helped us do is um, reduce or eliminate our remedial sequence uh, for students because students will get stuck in remediation, uh, particularly in math they will get stuck and they, they tend to just stay there and they burn a lot of time, they burn a lot of financial aid, and one thing that they also burn is a lot of self-efficacy when they're stuck in that remedial sequence. Like, they don't see a way out, and so then what becomes their way out is just leaving college completely. And this is not what we want them to do. And now, I'm not picking on math because we will see this in English as well that students who struggle with writing skills, or um, as I was having lunch with one of our uh, full-time English instructors, sometimes their attitude towards writing will also be um, a hindrance to them progressing towards having a transfer level courses for completion. And so AB 705 is forcing us to really re-examine the way that we look at how students are engaging uh, their academics, but most importantly, it's forcing us to look at how we look at student success in terms of a pathway that we provide for them. So what generally happens is student kind of comes to college and just says, hey, I'm ready for college, I promise. I can do everything that you want me to do. Just let me in and I'll show you. And now it's more like, as Rob was saying, I'm just kind of here to take some classes and we have to be like, great, this is so awesome. This is, a, this is a success that you just showed up. Now it's our job to make sure that we have all of these support and resources in place so that you can stay on your pathway so that you can actually reach your goal, which more than likely would be getting some sort of certificate, a transfer degree or transferring all together so that you can get the job that you want and so that you can continue on with your life. I think um, earlier I said that it was kind of akin to um, bumper bowling. And so and I thought about it just a little bit more and I thought, okay, so it probably more looks like this. We invite you to come bowling. You've never been, but we want you to know everything about it because it, I understand it. The heart of it is good. It's right, and it's my pathway. Yes. Right, my my bowling pathway. <laughs> Except I'm I'm not a I'm not a good bowler. But if you can just imagine that you come to the bowling alley, and um, and I know I never know how to work the machines because they always change them. How do you put your name in? How do you start the game? You know, do I go and ask for shoes or do I pay for shoes then? You know, do I have to go get an orange ball, a green ball, a red ball? I don't even know. But what I do know is that if you don't expect me to bowl a strike the first time I walk into the bowling alley, but if you put up some bumpers, at least I'm not expected to bowl a gutter ball. And that if I throw the ball down the alley, it'll end up somewhere and I can get something for it. And I also learned earlier that I can bowl 100 and still be a winner. And that's kind of... Unless you're bowling against Vince. Exactly, because Vince bowls 300s all the time. Vince is a pro bowler. But the whole idea is that there's support there to help me get to where I want to be in terms of just finishing out that entire process. And that's what AB 705 should be doing for our students as well. We should have as many supports available for students to help them stay on their pathway and reach success that they want to reach. If I can put something on top of that, um, which is that uh, AB 705 is a requirement, right? Um, and it's a requirement that we're going to be putting on our students. And as we, we talked about the idea of access for, for so long, um, we took away a lot of requirements for students. Um, 
Um, and so this is giving us permission, once again, to put requirements on the student experience that we know are going to make them successful. Um, it's doing it in a way uh, that uh, is purposeful, not just requiring something to require it, but requiring it because we know uh, that it's beneficial to students. Uh, and I, I think that this law in, in its uh, perfection um, uh, gives us that, that opportunity uh, to, to do that in, in the ways that we, we can. We need to do that. And it's not always about um, requiring things. Sometimes it, it might be suggesting things. Uh, and Priya, you talked earlier about the idea of opting out. Yeah. Uh, if you want to elaborate on, on that. Thanks, Josh. So the idea is that if we want, if we know that there are evidence-based strategies that are in the best interest of students, um, through national research, through your own research at Coastline that show that students who engage in X have a better chance of making it through and being um, successful even in the intermediate run, it doesn't have to be mandatory. It can also give the sense that this is just the normal way of being a student at, coast, at Coastline. So the idea of doing like an opt-out service versus an opt-in. Um, right now, students have to raise their hand if they want something. And the students who usually n could really benefit from the service are usually the ones that are least likely to raise their hand. So what this does, and it's also around kind of addressing stigma and, and trying to make it all natural, right? It's saying the default experience is that every student is going to partake in some form of an orientation. And if you don't need it for some reason, you have some background, you are an experienced student, whatever the case may be, you can speak with someone at the institution that can clear you of that path. So it's not saying that it's mandatory mandatory, but it's saying that more likely than not, students are going to benefit from the experience. And if students don't feel like that is the right fit for them, they can speak to someone about it. So where are there ways to make it um, uh, more likely that larger groups of students are going to engage in that good practice? Thank you. And then if you can talk a little bit about how it fits in with the national. I got part of the Basic Skills Initiative. I was the administrator uh, for the first year of the Basic Skills Initiative. I mean, we. we when we, look at the, when we looked at the data then, we knew we had a problem. I think early, if you go back to the 2000 to 2008 time frame, we started looking at the progression data in DevEd and in math and English, what we call basic skills in California. And we're like, well, this isn't working. And you know, if you went down to the lower levels, you'd find a 5% of students ever got to a transfer level math course. Um, it was shocking how highly consistent this data was, level by level, across the country. Right, so early on, a lot of our thoughts were about doubling time on task and we're gonna throw more resources at this. And we were engaging in what we came to realize later was very fixed models of thinking. We were functionally fixated on the idea that this course sequence was the right sequence. Well, it turns out a couple early Mavericks went around with the idea, well, let's see what happens if we flip this and assume that we can actually help students reach these goals in a very different way, whether it was through acceleration models like Statway Quantway, or co-rec models like uh, Baltimore County Accelerated Learning Project, or um, the co-rec st stuff that happened in Tennessee, where putting the vast majority, if not all, of the students into the transfer level course with the right level of support, turns out, although it's completely counterintuitive, that actually works a lot better. And one thing I didn't say this morning that I just remembered after I said it, is it actually works better at every level of preparedness Right? even down to the lowest levels. Now, if you go down to people who come in with a fourth grade math level and you put them directly into a transfer level math course, preferably statistics or quantitative reasoning and not algebra, which we'll talk about in a second, they're not gonna do that well in the aggregate, right? Um, what the data out of Tennessee statewide found is, yeah, only 35% of those students actually succeed. And you wanna say, well, that's horrible. Only 35% of people are passing this course until you looked at the data of what happened before. And if they were three levels below, only 4% of them right. ever made it through in three years. So we have to be careful about how we frame these questions, and it's why the Guided Pathways movement frames the question around DevEd is, what percentage of students pass transfer level math and or English in their first year? You're never getting to 100. But historically in California, by the way, that number for math is 11%. Pass transfer level math in the first year. Our friends in Koyamaka down the road, I know no one wants to hear this anymore, who have implemented transfer level co recs in math using alternate math pathways, the number is between 50 and 60%. That's the level of improvement we're talking about. And to be clear in math, it's not that they're putting them all in algebra. 
you need alternate math pathways. And this is where DevEd connects with pathways. If, if you're going to ask me the question, what's the right math course for Vince? Well, I need to know what Vince's major is. Right? I, by the way, I think the default answer is statistics. And the default answer historically has been algebra. But I need to know whether Vince is a STEM major or Vince is a humanities major. If he's a STEM major, he's going to have to figure, we're going to have to figure out how to help him on the calculus through calculus sequence, including algebra. If he's a psych major or humanities major, he needs statistics or quantitative reasoning. So this is how the pathways model intersects with the DevEd reform. Um, and I mean, I, look, I know no one loves this legislation. I'm not a big legislative fiat guy. I think legislators tend not to get new ones very well. Um, but even if people didn't want this to work in California, it will work. Like we've proven this in other states where it was legislated, the fact that this is never going to work. Turns out it works even if you don't want it to work. Right? So the question is, how do we optimize it, and how do we build it into a pathway model? Thank you. So we have one more question. Oh, one more question, and then we can do audience questions. Is that good? Yeah? Okay. Um, the last question is I wanted to talk, I want, would love for you to talk a little bit about the role of counselors and advising and program maps in the pathways movement. So there's been discussions about faculty advising and how do counselors play a role? And I know Rob, you and I had a good conversation about that earlier. Well, I, I would just say that the, the map doesn't replace the counselor. The map is a guide. It's, it's kind of the, the map, it's, it's like any other map. It doesn't replace the journey. Right? There's still things that you have to encounter as you're trying to get to your destination. And the map just kind of illustrates you know, the pathway for you. Now you know you can deviate from the map and find interesting things along the way. It'll take you a little bit longer to get to your destination. Um, same is true with guided pathways, or coastline pathways. But um, it really helps make sure that everyone that is engaging the student is engaging the student in the direction that the student wishes to travel in. And even if that student wishes to divert, everyone then is aware that they want to divert off the pathway, and they can have that conversation with the student as to what those consequences are, whether they be positive or negative. And so the, path, the map doesn't replace any of that. It just helps the engagement process so that it's relevant uh, to the student and what it is that they want to do and helping them understand that here's where success is and here's where they are and this is how much, as Ross said earlier, this is how much time it's going to take you to reach your destination. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, go see the big ball of string someplace else and then get back on Route 66 and go where you want to go. To, to, to add to that, you know, one of the, the benefits is not just the, the, the map, which is the default kind of for every program. It's that on top of that, we have the areas of interest. And so, for example, if you were to choose psychology, it's as important for you to know that you're part of the social science area of interest, right? Because then that leads you down the path of understanding everything related to social sciences and how your area, your whatever you want to major in, fits into that area of social sciences. And that'll help for careers and that'll help for a lot of different things, right? And that also helps that if we have general education specific to areas of interest, if I switch from psychology to sociology, I'm still in the right path for general education, right? As well, we want to make sure that they're going to make those decisions early. So if in that first semester they're interested in the areas of social science and they say, you know what, social science isn't for me, I really want to go into business, right? They've made that decision much earlier and then they can move over to the other area of interest and they'll have less extra classes to take. They may have the right amount of classes and now they only have to take an extra one extra three unit class as opposed to taking more classes. I always use my example. I was a business major when I started and then I wanted to switch over to the social sciences. Uh, I looked at communication and it was great. I didn't have to take that extra math class. I was also interested in psychology. But if I went to psychology, I was gonna have to go back and take statistics as the prerequisite for a research methods class, right? Hence why I'm now your communication studies faculty member is that, that extra math class made, made, that, made that decision for me. But that in and of itself demonstrates that uh, if we have those maps done correctly, it helps the students to make that decision earlier. And then when they do have to switch paths, 
they can do that also much easier. Uh, I think it's also important to, to keep the student on the path. I mean, you throw a map at somebody, yeah, it'll get them there. But you know, you need that support to kind of keep you on the path. Okay, why aren't you taking this class this semester? Is there something wrong? Do we need to kind of maybe give you some extra support? Um, as well as, you know, like I was, when I was in college, I kind of got antsy when I started to get my degree. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna double major. And I met with a counselor and they're like, you're there, like, you can get into a job and you know get your get your career started. Why do you want to do this? Just because I was antsy. So meeting with a counselor kind of helped me do that and get me back on my path. Yeah, I mean, it's somewhat again counterintuitive. What we're creating in guided pathways is a greater demand characteristic for advising. Right before, what we basically did was, all right, well, come in and take your gen eds and come see us if you need help. And that's basically the default model at all community colleges. Kind of, well, as it turns out, when you look at the data, as we've said numerous times today, the people who are asked for help are the ones who least need it. The people who need the help don't ask for it. Right. So what we're trying to create are structures that catch students all at various points along the way and provide them the support they need. And it's why this idea of a customized education plan is so critical. Um, and But the other thing, by the way, is students don't pass all their courses. Right? I mean, so let's say I didn't pass bio 10 this spring. I don't know what that means. For, it means very different things, by the way, from my path. If I'm pre-nursing, pre-med, or that was a gen ed course, right? If it was a gen ed course, it was probably the wrong gen ed course. I should have taken for sciences or something that's not less challenging than bio 10. Um, sorry for your sciences people. But, um, you know, so the point here about advising is we want to help people make the right decisions. And I think, one of the Priya's always brings up this, you know, the, what are the two biggest factors for student support we define? What are students? Students are familiar with student support. Student support we define. Students support we define. There was a research study that was done through the RT group a few years ago, Rob and I, and yeah. people worked on it. it. Was basically where we did um, uh, a a set of interviews with 900 community college students in California, and then focus groups with about 100 of them, and we asked them, "What do you need to be successful at the institution?" And the six big factors that came out, and this was also corroborated by uh, literature review, was students want to be directed and focused. Those they, are the top two. The top two, and I'll come back to those. Students wanted to be directed and focused. Students wanted to be connected and engaged. And students wanted to be nurtured and valued. And I would argue that as humans, we all want those six things. But the two that were the most um, provocative were the directed and focused, that students wanted help identifying what their educational goal would be based on their skills, interests, career aspirations. And then students wanted to be focused where they wanted to know how to get through to the end of that particular goal. And those two have such large areas of overlap with guided path pathways, which is trying to help students um, not restrict choice, as you had mentioned earlier as, as a misconception, but if anything, to help them identify these um, choices early and then know what they need to do. And also, when you were talking earlier about student successes, also know how far along the path am I? How many other classes do I, am I here for five more years or do I have three more classes that I need to finish? This kind of self-agency on the student's part of knowing what they're doing with their, their educational needs. Finally, we'll say on it, advising is not a person, it's a function. Right, we get too wrapped up, we do this in California, we do it in other states, so who's the advisor? Who's the counselor? Rather than students need help on their journeys, and they're getting that advising and help from faculty, from counselors, from student services staff, from the, and from, from places the administrative you don't wish. assistant. Yeah, right. My favorite <laughs> advisor on your campus is the department administrative assistant. Is it not an administrative assistant today? It's not called something different. Yeah, it is. Mr. President, like that is someone at most community college campuses, like if you're sitting at the front of the social science department and you're the classified staff, you're doing advising because people are asking you questions they don't want to ask their faculty, they don't want to ask their dean. So this notion of, of we're all advising, um, and that's something that's really important. One thing we have to think about when we build advising support structures is who's doing what, when, to what end. Right, you're going to have people recruiting who are doing initial advising. You're going to have onboarding people. That's some advising. Your orientation process, a first semester experience course. Then you have counseling faculty. How does that all work together? That's some of the intentionality you need in your advising approach. Thank you so much. We have about 15 minutes for questions, so I want to get Mitch. 
I was just going to ask, we were talking about. Sorry, I'm going to ask you the microphone because we're recording. So we were talking about AB 705 a few minutes ago. And for those students on the bin in business and STEM track, the predicted success rate in those prerequisite classes is in the 30s. Yes. What's the institutional support that you've seen to be successful to bring that up and to make those students persist? Because if you see a class where it's a 30 percent success rate, the persistence is going to drop. Yeah. There's a, so it just brings up a number of questions of. Uh, who's in the kind of business and STEM pathways and why are they in there? So there's a guided pathways question for that person. By the way, business isn't business, as you know. There's a business that requires the kind of algebra and calculus to pathway, and then there's other parts of business that don't. Um, so I think there's an initial kind of fork in the road on who's going into which program. Uh, is it the case that students struggle still in the co -rec models in the STEM pathways? Absolutely. What colleges are trying to do there is build up the support in the co-rec model, like that is stronger, to, earlier in the process. So you're trying to get the students to, to be caught with a model. And what Tennessee does on this is a couple of the colleges, is the number of hours of that co-rec course varies by the level of preparation of the student. So if you test college level, you take algebra. If you test one level below, you've got a one hour course below. You test three levels below, you've got a three hour required course. And um, I want to be really, really clear about something with 8705. It is actually not designed to fix the problem for the lowest 10 or 15 percent of students. It's absolutely, by the way, just to remind yourself, what we were doing historically wasn't solving that problem either. Right? Neither of the solutions are designed to solve the problem of what happens when a student comes to us with a fourth grade reading or writing mode. We don't want to give up on those students, but that's actually not who this, the model is designed to help fix things for. It's designed for the people who are one level below, maybe two levels below, in the classic assessment culture. Um, and Mitch, you're absolutely right. There's a, there's a question there about should students who are not able to get through the algebra sequence continue to go down the path of, and we allow them to be pre-nursing, for example. I would argue that the answer after a year is no. Right? We need to have honest conversations with folks that say, look, if you can't make it through these initial stages of the math courses and the, and the sequence, and even if it's a two-semester acceleration model, I think we have to intervene. And some colleges have done this at some point to say, maybe this isn't the right path for you. Maybe we need to get you on a different path. Because frankly, we're taking their money under a false pretense that they're actually going to be successful in getting into the nursing program. You can't do that day one, because I worry about the kind of tracking and equity things that would happen if you try to make a decision day one, who gets into STEM and who doesn't. Um, but I do think there's a point at which we need to intervene, maybe not on the math side, but on the what path are you on side. And it's not a perfect answer to your question, because there is, we, I don't think anyone knows yet what to do with students who are so incredibly dedicated to the idea of being in STEM, who can't get through the math course. I have not heard of a model that helps those students. The CORAC model is actually not designed to help those students. It is designed to help students who are A, either one or two levels below, and B, it siphons off the 75% of students who don't need the algebra to STEM route. I mean, that would be totally honest with this, right? I mean, in the Tennessee data, when you look at those amazing success rates, the CCRC's done a little bit of analysis, it's not published yet, that at least half of the success is in taking the right math course, right? And when you take the right math course, it's a lot easier to pass statistics or quantitative reasoning in one semester of sport than it is algebra. I do not think we have a great answer on this problem yet. What about the students we can't convince out of there? How do we help them through? I don't know that we have an answer. And we just have to be completely honest about it. Thank you. Other questions? Feedback. Mike. Of course, furthest away from me. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Shea. I'm a retention specialist here. I've been here for four months, so I'm still learning about a lot about the college. Um, I was here in the earlier session and I had a question um, because I've been doing a lot of like research on the demographics of the coastline. And um, you know, there was talking in the earlier session about part time. But one thing that wasn't discussed really was um, the fact that this college serves primarily online learners. So my question is, um, I'm not, I'm not sure um, 
uh, if you worked with largely online community colleges. So if you have, I'm wondering if you can kind of share kind of any insights you've had from working with them. And, um, because that's something that I'm thinking about is like, if you look at the data on research around like if students are um, face to face, they're taking like mixed modalities, or they're taking only online, the persistence in graduation looks vastly different. So I'm just wondering if you can share any like insight you have that, on that. If you haven't, um, what are some things that we need to think about as, a, as an institution to um, understand how guided pathways can look different for, for all of us? All right, and so you've already drawn the distinction that's maybe the most important there is the question of whether students are online fully or partially online. Um, you are, so this is, let's talk about other community colleges particularly. At most community colleges, the percentage of students who are only online is very low. Most students who are online are also face-to-face -face students, right? And so that's usually because at most colleges, what are they using the online courses for? Scheduling, right? Because they can't actually schedule the courses they want or they think it's easier. So we have to distinguish that first. And so you you have your coastline a slightly different history, slightly different scenario. I think it makes a bunch of the questions of guided pathways even more important. How do we create a connected student experience? How do we provide students with the right support? And I think for me, the question with your online students has always been, are they in online programs? Or are they just taking one course? Right, if they're a Fullerton student who's just taking algebra, like that's a different, we don't really worry about that student, right? But who are your truly online students? And what are they trying to do here? Um, yeah, I would say, I think my analysis of why well, we've been around you guys for a couple of years, is you may not have a good as, as good a handle on that as maybe you should. Because the question of why are these students online, where are they, what are they trying to do, and this is, by the way, I don't blame Coastline for this, but you're in a system, a higher educational system in California and nationally, that's focused on courses. So it's about what courses should we offer, can we fill this course, do I need to open another section of this course? Like, we are not set up to think about how those courses translate into programs. And so this is perhaps doubly or triply important in the online only world, where it's really easy just to take a bunch of courses, right? So I think that's one aspect of it. Another is the service provision, right? The idea of how do you create an onboarding and support experience in the online environment that helps students get the support they need to know what they need to take to figure out what they're trying to go. And, you know, we talk to online colleges. So the, the college that is most like you in the country that is doing pathways work at the moment is where I'll be tomorrow in Phoenix. It's Rio Salado. Um, Rio Salado and Phoenix, has, uh, they are exclusively online until recently, um, maybe even less so face to face than you guys have here. Um, and they, they do have a number of online programs, but they've been in this same boat as you, where they have a lot of single course taking going on and random course taking. And so they are trying to build this experience for their students to be much more intentional, much more supported. So I just think in, in the aggregate, the answer for you guys would be to have a better understanding. Of, of what your online students are trying to do with their time with you, where they're trying to go, and perhaps it's even more important if they're, let's just, I mean, I still am somewhat suspicious, not suspicious, not skeptical, that the answer is a lot of these students are living in a mountain cabin where they can't go, like, like they're, they're, they're really are so remote, like, I mean, yes, your military and prison people are remote, I think that's a different population, but when you talk about the non-military, non-prison online population, where are they? And so to me, the immediate thing I think of is, look, if they're at the top of Mount Tamalpais in Berkeley, and there's a cabin up there, and they happen to have satellite Wi-Fi access, the first question I'd be asking that student is, what are you going to do when you're done with these courses? Are you coming down off the mountain? Or are you I mean, I mean, serious. I'm actually serious about this. What is it their goal? Or are they trying to find a job that lets them stay up on the mountain? All right, well, that's a limited number of jobs. We need to cancel that student more. We need to understand what that student what are their degrees of freedom and what they're trying to get? Is it the case that they're just finishing this stage online and they're going to move into a different aspect of their life? So I think maybe even more so for you than it would be for Orange Coast, that that journey your online students are on is more opaque um, now and it needs to be more managed going forward. And what do you guys think? You guys have Josh, you've wrestled with these issues a while and then we talked about them. Yeah. Um, I think one of, the, one of the concerns that we have to think about with our, our online learners, right, um, is the a lot of a lot of what Rob talked about, but it, it, I think what what resonates with me most of what Rob said is that we have to have a handle on who our online students really are, 
right? And what they want, right. what they want. and what are their capabilities of coming to coastline face to face, right? So do we have face to face onboarding uh, regardless of the fact that we say all of our students or 70% of our students are online? Is that a benefit to us, right? Uh, I'll see tons of heads shaking like it's blasphemy uh, to say that we should uh, think about how we schedule our online classes alongside our face-to-face -face classes uh, to increase face-to-face -face enrollments, right? Uh, and utilize our sites, our campuses. We do have, we do have three of them, right? Uh, and so this is something that Coastline is gonna have to grapple with over the next few years as we move forward with Pathways uh, is our identity uh, as a either fully online, 100% online college or you know face-to-face -face as well. Right? Where is it? What is it that our where is it that our students are, and what is it that our students want? These are these are tough conversations to have. They're not going to be easy. Um, there are conversations about what's the demand. You know, students are demanding online classes. Right? Are we giving students online classes because uh, that's what they want? Right? Or is that because what they really need, or is that what helps them to succeed? Right? We're not asking those questions as much as probably we should. Right? And, and, that, and that's those because they're difficult conversations to be had. Right? We have them in instructional wing um, and uh, they take they take up a whole meeting, right? And then we don't get to any we don't get to other things, right? So these are just again, um, I don't necessarily have the answers. I come from a department that is uh, historically face-to-face, uh, -face, right? And we have moved online uh, to, to some degree, and we're moving further into that, that realm, right? Uh, but we also know that that may not be best for our students. Just because the student says they want the online class uh, might mean because that's the easiest thing for them doesn't necessarily mean that's the best thing for them either, right? And that doesn't improve persistence, that doesn't improve retention, and so those are the things that we have to, I think, those are the things we have to discuss. Those are the things that I've discussed with Rob, and Rob and I have just had, you know, frank conversations about how, how, do, how does an institution grapple with these tough, tough conversations? Not that we came up with answers, but how do they, how do we get the conversation? The fine thing to stay on it is what you guys get to do is build that student experience. Like that is what the process you're involved in right now is designing what you want that student experience to be. Look at it through the lens of an online only student and figure out what are the things you want to ensure that that student gets and that student knows. Like we have to backward design from that. And I think that you have a couple unique lenses. You have the military lens, you have the prison lens, you have the online only lens. And then you've got the campus like geography lens. Like can I do an entire psychology program at Fountain Valley versus Huntington Beach? Like you have to answer all those types of questions. I want to, uh, my boss raises hand, so. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Rob kind of hit on it. I think there's not one coastline student. There are a variety. Just like if you took all of us in the room and what type of student were we, we were all different. So there would be an online student, there would be an on-site student, and there would be some that are a combination of both. And how do we design it for those different types? Right, and you can't design 100% of the scenarios. You're not trying to. Right, but what are the big personas you have? Like these kind of student stories, and I think the one the gentleman in the back brought up, there's one type of student. It's an online only student who's trying to do a program. Okay, so what would we do in that case, right? And I think this is the work you have between now and next fall for version 1.0 is now you've got a lot of activity on these key things you walked around to the tables on, which are all really important. How does this connect to the things we want to see in the student experience for every student of a certain type trying to do a certain thing. That's the design work that comes next. And then it gets translated and you do it once and see where the holes are, right? I mean, that's the thing we didn't talk much about in this session this morning. This is a journey, right? We talked about some colleges who started back in 2011, like Lorraine County in Ohio, has some great examples of things Josh mentioned this morning. I can tell you, because I've worked with them since 2011, in 2015, they didn't have much. Right, they had rolled something out, they were still learning, so like this idea that this goes on and 
next fall is not the end, it's the start of your work, really, of how do we do, continue to design and optimize the student experience and ask the tough questions like the one you're asking. Of, you know, and then the one Josh say, why are they online? Right, is it because of scheduling? Is it because of this? Is it because of that? And what do we think is the optimal way for them to reach their goals? Thank and you so much. Can I just say yeah. something too? And I just want to make sure that I'm hearing this correctly is that you're not suggesting that we just scrap everything that we have, focus on the one student group, right? And then for fall, like put that into place, see what happens, oh, no, no, see no. what the gaps are. Definitely not it's, it's, it, it, right, because I just want to make sure that, that not only am I hearing it correctly, but everyone else is hearing it correctly. It's not one over the other. Right, like you said, it's the journey, it's the process, it's the pathway for Coastline, right? Coastline has to be on its own pathway as well, trying to figure out where their goal is, where our goal is, and how we're going to get there. And there will be some off-ramps along the way, and we're going to have to find our way back because we're just like students. We're going to figure out, oh, I thought this was what I really wanted. I thought this was what was going to work for me. And it really doesn't. I need to get back on to the pathway um, and the map that was created for me yeah. and, and see if that still gets me to where I want to go. I mean, you, you, what I would suggest is picking the two or three most likely personas your students will find themselves in. At most colleges, that would be recent high school grads, returning adults, and fill in the blank for number three. Yes. For you, it's a little bit different because of your unique history. And I think one of the things we said this morning is, look, I wouldn't worry too much about your military and prison populations and integration into pathways, because in a lot of ways, they're already getting that experience by the management of the people who manage your military programs and manage the prison population. This is probably about the other populations and the ones who don't have the benefit of those type of things. And I, so I couldn't agree more. Like you have to think what is different about that recent graduate from Fountain Valley, I just made up Fountain Valley High School versus someone who's worked for 12 years and is coming back and saying, I don't like the dead end job I have. Mm -hmm. right? Those are two very different students. What's the experience different versus the mythical Mount Tam student? I think, I think Dana said something also that's also really important for us to remember is that we, we for a long time now have been integrating like the growth mindset into the path of yeah. the student. Right? And this is something that Rob and Perry and I talked about at lunch. And it's actually something that we need to adopt more for ourselves. Right. We need to make sure that we are looking at growth and looking how to synthesize what we see outside uh, in other colleges to working at our own college. That doesn't mean we have to do what Rio Salado is doing because they've got an uh, online population, but there are things that they're probably doing that we can integrate into our own framework that will, will help us. And I think that, that makes us uh, a stronger um, makes a stronger case for us to be successful at Pathways is that if we adopt that mindset, then we can continue to grow as we implement over the next 10, 20 years of, of Coastline. Thank you. So now I would like to invite Dr. Adrian up for some closing remarks, and then we'll have the raffle to give away these three lovely mystery surprises. First, I want to thank our panelists. If we could give them a big round of applause. I want to thank all of you for being here. I think one of the things that I've worried about the most and continue to be concerned about is how engaged everyone is at the college. Um, and I think that it's really important that you're here because it shows that you're engaged, that you're interested, and you may still be exploring like we are, but that you're open. I also want to thank Dr. Lorraine Pensky. If you could please stand, Dr. Pensky. She's the president of our board. member of our board, the one that's predictable, that will support us in every way, in every day, it's Dr. Prinsky. So thank you so much for being here. I, think, I wish that we had more of these kinds of um, uh, sessions and tough conversations, and I hope that this will be built in as we go forward. Again, like I said, the thing that I worry about, I don't worry that we will design, that the teams will design. I worry a little bit about the handoff because those are being designed for departments that will actually carry them out. But, but it will be done not necessarily 
uh, by the teams. And so I, were, I, I hope that there will be great engagement. But I want to thank Josh and Shelley for providing the leadership. I think we've come a long way. I think Rob will agree. He's been with us through this journey. Uh, but we have yet a long way to go. And so it's really great to hear that it really is a journey for us, that there's no end point just because we said we will launch in fall 2020 doesn't mean that it ends there. Um, and we talked about, I think in one of the games, is that this is not a fad, right? I think it's been discussed this morning and again this afternoon, and that this is a vision. It's really a vision for our students, a vision that they will have a better experience as they come to our colleges. In fact, the best experience, hopefully, from any others that they may have had or that they will, that will have for the rest of their lives, and that we will increase the outcomes because of the things that we have intentionally and carefully designed for them. Uh, and that it's not about doing more work. I love that too, Priya, thank you for that thought. That it also means that we will re-examine, we will re-imagine, we will re-architect what we're doing now. And it may be that we say, you know what, we're not going to do that. And it's really asking the question, why? Why are we doing the things we're doing? Oftentimes, I think, in community colleges, we tend to say, well, because that's because Title V tells us we're going to do that. And unfortunately, that's most of the time that's true. But Title V is also in interpreted and implemented in different ways. An example, uh, I think five years ago or so now, we used to not allow students to retake you know, the, the assessment test until like six months to a year. I was shocked to learn about that because most community colleges would give you three weeks or four weeks. So you've had time to think about it. You'd have time to study. Uh, Etc. So uh, there were a couple of things today that I hope we will explore further. I really liked and appreciated the idea that, and I know Rob, you've talked to us about this, and I hope that we've built into this in our design teams, that we need to build the guided pathways or coastline pathways for the students who are part-time, and how do we create an environment in which they will be more full-time, and I think your support, uh, Priya, would help us. How do we package? financial aid or financial support that will do that. And then the other thing that I'm, I guess because coming from student services, I have great admiration and respect for counselors. And so I'm, I want to be careful and not be interpreted as anti-counseling. So I really appreciate that advising is a function. And I think we need to recognize that, that students need advising along the way, not the one hour orientation or the two hour orientation. They need different types of information and different types of support at different times in their lives. So I hope that in our guided pathways, we will really think about how we intentionally provide advising through a cadre of different uh, individuals that work for us at the college. So again, thank you for all of the time that you've uh, devoted today. I want to thank the people and the work and design teams that have been here the whole day. Um, and thank you again for being here. And I hope that you will uh, continue to get engaged, ask questions. The questions that you asked today were great. Um, and we will have Rob again in the summer, I believe. And Priya too, thank you so much for that. And, and now I know that I'm standing between you and the prize. Oh, okay. I didn't have it to be my name. I did not do that. Okay, Leah Fleming. I want to thank Leah, because Leah has been sitting, siting there with all this wonderful, uh, and a lot of activities for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Yeah, <laughs> Morales, he was here this morning. <laughs> Marie Hewlett. <laughs> I also want to thank the distance learning staff that's been here, that have been providing support, Jerry Hyde, um, and everyone, Kim, Vaughn, Helen, Cindy. <laughs> I'll do the thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, the core team, we are adjourning to a meeting across the way on the fourth floor. <laughs>